Here's a live look inside Queen's Park at this hour. It is budget day in Ontario, a day where residents, families, workers and businesses in this province will learn what the government has in store for its finances. It is 342, 5 degrees from 299 Queen Street West. This is Toronto's breaking news, CP24. Hello, I'm Scott Hurst, and welcome to our special coverage of the 2023 Ontario budget. Of course, all eyes will be on Premier Ford and his finance minister this afternoon as they get set to reveal their fiscal blueprint for the province of Ontario. We all know some of the major issues at play here, inflation, housing, health care, education and transit, just some of the issues that impact everyone's day-to-day -day lives. Peter Bethenfalvi has already hinted the budget will be, quote, responsible and take a targeted approach during these uncertain economic times. And we'll find out much more coming up in just about uh, just over 15 minutes time, probably right around 4 p.m. is when we're expecting the finance minister to raise inside and deliver the budget. Now, joining us live to discuss the issues at hand and help break down the numbers is our expert panel, expert political panel here as we talk about the budget. Uh, John Capobianco on the far end, political strategist and senior vice president at Fleischman Hillard High Road. Thanks so much for joining us and providing your insight. Kemma Joseph sitting next to him right in the middle with Crestview Strategy. Thanks so much for your time as Thank well. You. And Grattan Singh, former NDP MPP, all of them to break this all down. It's an honor to be on this panel with you guys. Thanks so much for being in here. Uh, John, I want to start with you. This budget, as we've heard, the little tidbits that we've heard from the finance minister himself, um, comes at a time of surging revenues, but at the same time, a lot of caution as there might be a potential for an economic slowdown later this year. So what he has said, this budget is a plan to build and attract jobs, invest in infrastructure, but at the same time, after unprecedented spending throughout the COVID-19 pandemic to get us through the pandemic, now is the time for what he says is restraint. What does restraint mean to you in this budget? Well, I think you said it earlier too, Scott. I think you described it as a responsible, not you, but the minister described it as a responsible budget. I think it's going to be a responsible budget. It's going to be one of balance. I think they're going to, they're going to obviously um, uh, work on the plan that they've had for some years now uh, on, on infrastructure and on building Ontario and making sure that there's jobs and opportunities for people, yet still uh, being, in mind, being mindful of the fact that the economy is still very much in, in flux and mm -hmm. we've got inflation that's, that's still rising and, and, and gas prices and food prices so there's a lot of there's a lot of balancing that has to happen I think and this also this budget is, is actually an interesting one because it's the first budget that that sort of was post pandemic I think mm -hmm. the last budget the province brought down was an election budget because we went to an election and Ontarians ended up re-electing Doug Ford as a result of that but this budget I think is one where the pandemic's behind us in, in large part and now we have to sort of build a bit of a foundation for what is going to be hopefully, you know, a, a robust economic future. Mm -hmm. As we continue to look live inside Queen's Park, a lot of people kind of walking around trying to get settled. As you said, we're about 15 minutes away from when they're going to deliver the budget. Kim, I want to turn to you now, specifically uh, when it comes to municipalities, cities. We've heard from Toronto specifically. There's a big ask there that Toronto has towards the province to cover some of their costs. Toronto has long-term funding problems and in particular 500 million in what's being called COVID-19 hangover costs. Um, municipalities are looking to this a lot. Toronto, obviously the biggest municipality here uh, with the biggest financial asks. What do you expect Toronto and other, municipality, other municipalities to get out of this or not get out of the provincial budget? Well, I think you said it. We saw the deputy mayor earlier this week um, both ask not only the provincial uh, finance minister, but also the federal minister, to s provide them with almost a billion dollars to fill up that hole that, like you said, COVID, the pandemic has caused. Um, I think they're looking for support for very core services that should align with the province, so transit, building additional housing. We're seeing the influx of immigrants. I think Toronto wants to be able to welcome them, but need the support from the provincial government to, mm -hmm. you know, provide the core services to really truly welcome these immigrants. And I think also safety has been a tremendous headache for Torontonians and people outside of the GTHA. I'm sure that um, the Toronto and other municipalities across the city would like the support from the province to, in terms of tackling those, those core issues that are bothering and have been bothering folks for, for the past few months. Mm -hmm. And just to follow up with that quickly, uh, listening to the Premier earlier today, he was asked about the specific ask that Toronto has and saying not just Toronto but municipalities, mm -hmm. he's looking to audit them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. saying that, you know, it's not the fact that people don't like paying taxes, they don't like the fact that their money, their, these tax money is wasted somewhere. That didn't really sound like a premier that's too keen on, on spending much more money. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there is a lot of money going to municipalities, and mm -hmm. Toronto in particular. Um, 
but it doesn't really seem like that's a premier that's too keen on sending much more money for these bills that municipalities are saying we need help covering. Yeah, it's also a premier who's not very keen on setting a precedent of having to bail out municipalities. I think mm -hmm. he wants to ensure that. And also, this is a premier who has sit on, sat on city council, who understands mm -hmm. the workings of city hall. And I think, I do not say that the deputy mayor is bluffing, but I think he understands that there may be other ways for the city to um, get that money. So I think he's trying to establish a very um, strong boundary and also doesn't mm -hmm. want to have to signal to the federal government that he has this money to offer to the Nunes Valley. So, like um, John mentioned, there's a fine rope that the Premier is yeah. going to have to balance here. Yeah, and we're, we're getting closer to when we're going to actually learn uh, what is in this budget from the Finance Minister Grattan. I want to turn to you now, uh, particularly the opposition uh, looking at this time saying there's been a lot of underfunding from this government on major, uh, major um, uh, funding in terms of health care, education, and other social programs all while they're sitting on billions of dollars in contingency funds. And so they've been saying for many, uh, for a lot of time now, saying you're underfunding these to create this contingency fund. Why not pump that into these severely underfunded programs? You, you, you took the words right out of my mouth. Uh, <laughs> if you look at actually the situation, let's just paint the, paint the picture, set the stage right now. People are struggling right now. It is an incredibly <clears throat> tough time right now. And some of the main issues are, uh, cost of living, housing, oh. and health care. And health care particularly, if we talk about this subject, especially during the pandemic and now, the Premier has been sitting on a huge amount of surplus funds. And instead of using those funds, he has underfunded health care and resulted in a health care crisis. Mm -hmm. And now the solution is going to be, quote unquote, privatization, or it is privatization, which is going to worsen our health care system. And that's why the NDP is fighting to say, we need to invest right now into Ontarians. We need to make sure health care stays public and we need to make sure that people are not getting, uh, having to face these hour-long wait times in emergency rooms. We're not seeing nurses being laid off and emergency rooms shutting down. We need immediate action. It's a tough time right now and then he's going to be fighting to make sure that people have what they need to get through these tough times. All right. Thank you so much for your initial comments. Of course, we're now still waiting for uh find out exactly what is in this budget. We can all speculate. We can all talk about what we think will happen. Uh, we've been listening to some breadcrumbs over the past couple days and weeks about what this government is focused on. Uh, we're just uh, probably about 10 minutes away from when we're going to hear the Finance Minister Peter Bethan um present the budget. And so uh, we'll be on that soon. But in the meantime, we'll take a quick break and we'll be back with more on the budget in moments. Stay with us. Let's get back to our panel as we await the tabling of the budget. Here's a live look inside Queen's Park. Of course, we're just minutes away from the ceremonial part of this process where we see the Premier and the Finance Minister walking out of the Premier's office towards the legislature and then rising in the legislature and presenting the budget. Uh, as we get back to our panel, John, I want to follow up. As you mentioned, this is particularly uh, this government's first budget post COVID-19 where it's not the major theme in this budget. Last year, of course, they got elected on these promises that they put out there. How specifically are they looking at this where they can really focus on, as we've been hearing about these breadcrumbs, it's about building and it's about the labor force from their perspective. Well, I think a lot of it is going to be about that. I think we'll, we'll certainly find out pretty soon, but I think it's going to be a lot about the sort of the building on infrastructure and, and sort of the, the budget that the premier had going into the election was all about highways and, and, and infrastructure and building hospitals and building roads and subways. And a lot of those commitments he has kept uh, through the co course of this last few months uh, that he's been in power and he's going to continue to build on that. So it's going to be a lot about infrastructure. It's going to be a lot about building hospitals and long-term care facilities. You saw a lot of announcements over the last little while, especially yesterday about manufacturing mm -hmm. and the tax credit to ensure that there's manufacturing continues to stay alive and more importantly that manufacturing stays in Ontario. A a lot of that, I suspect, will be in the budget, but also there'll be that balance about maybe talking about deficit control and making sure that the deficit comes un comes under control because we're uncertain times and we don't know what's going to happen. We're suspecting inflation mm -hmm. will, will taper over the course of the year, but that might not happen. We have to be careful. And Kevin, that interesting balance is this government has talked a lot about, about jobs and about infrastructure, but at the same time, people are struggling on day-to-day -day bills, on groceries, on just, you know, the basic things to get through the week, to get through the month. There needs to be that balance mm -hmm. where it's investing in the infrastructure and investing in growing the economy and jobs, but also people need immediate help. Yeah, no, and I totally agree. And that's very much what I'm curious to see if they're going to um, announce investment 
for people right now and not, you know, building stuff that is only going to have a ripple effect in three to four years from now. We've also seen budgets across the country being on, t like, table throughout um, the week and earlier, or last month, rather, and people were, you know, in Alberta, they've had the tax credit, which is exactly to get that kind of relief immediately, $200, $600 per family. I'm hoping to see that in this budget as well, because, like mm -hmm. you mentioned, people are suffering right now. You can't really wait two to three years for um, these buildings, you know, infrastructure to be built. I think people need relief right now. Um, because life of um, cost of living is really high. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the labor force, Grat, and here a big thing is you know still it still is a, at play here is Bill 124, where if you want to attract a lot of labor to this to this province, but you have this bill here that caps particular wages at a certain level. How does the government get past that where they talk about attracting jobs, but there is this sector where, where this bill is still potentially at play here? Bill 124 is in a great example of a, a bill that hurt frontline workers. We're talking about public sector workers, healthcare workers, nurses who were at the front line of our pandemic, but were not getting the respect that they needed with, uh, with regards to, to wages and salaries. You, you double that with the, with the fact that sick days are going to expire mm -hmm. next week. So you're creating this environment that is really setting every kind of card against those essential workers, those frontline healthcare heroes or people who run our economy and our healthcare systems. And it's tough. And that's why I think we need to make sure that this budget is addressing those gaps and putting for, uh, putting workers first, putting these people who are, who are really taking care of us, making sure that they're being taken care of as well by our province. And that's something that the NDP is going to be fighting for today. Mm -hmm. And Gretna, as we continue to, to watch uh, the, uh, this live shot from inside the legislature where we expect to see the premier uh, momentarily with the finance minister, I want to follow up with you on a question that, that I asked John moments ago. I believe we're about to see the Premier and the <clears throat> Finance Minister, but you can continue to uh, answer question. Feel free this to question. cut me off. Whenever, <laughs> the, that, whenever the big shot feel, comes. Feel free to, I'll cut him off if you need to. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll leave that up to you guys. They might be a little bit behind schedule. We're expecting them at uh, 3.55. Obviously, it's a little bit past that, um, but um, these guys are willing to cut each other off or talk over <laughs> each other. There's always a lot to say. And Grattan, I wanted to touch on that uh, question I had uh, posed to John there, where this is this government's first real post-pandemic budget, but the pandemic isn't behind us mm -hmm. completely. Of course, there's, we don't have the lockdowns and the mask mandates that we had from, from years past, and there isn't all this targeted relief towards Ontarians who, whose businesses are closed and, and we have limits on, on people who can enter and, or just, you know, when we had the major lockdowns. Um, what kind of focus does the, does the government still need to have about the pandemic? when we are often referred to it as a post-pandemic time now. And you, you said it best, right? This is a post-pandemic time. You can't remove an act like the pandemic never occurred. We are uh, seeing the, the fallout of this pandemic with regards to small businesses, workers, families, uh, mental health, healthcare across the board. When I was in the legislature, I remember a lot of folks described it like this. The pandemic really demonstrated the gaps that already existed in our healthcare system, the cracks in these services to frontline individuals. And so when we talk about a post-pandemic budget, it still needs to look to strengthen and learn from the lessons that the pandemic mm -hmm. demonstrated to us. You need a robust health care system. You need to make sure that frontline health care workers are getting the support they need. We need to be attracting nurses and uh, attracting and retaining nurses in this health care sector. So uh, I would say that this budget needs to have those things present. Because, you know, we're seeing nurses being laid off right now. We're seeing emergency mm -hmm. rooms closed, mm -hmm. and we have the shot that we need. So I'll pass it on to you. <laughs> and I didn't have to cut you off for a year natural of this business. <laughs> well, we can continue to talk over this as well. But uh, as we are seeing Premier Ford and the Finance Minister Peter Bethlenfalvy walk from the Premier's office, they're heading toward the legislature where they're going to obviously present this budget, what we're all waiting for. Uh, they're set to do it at 4 o'clock, and, you know, they were a couple minutes behind what they said leaving the office. But... As, uh, as many people know watching this who have been around Queen's Park, it, obviously it's not a crazy long walk to get there, but uh, this is the very ceremonial part of the budget. You can see them with the blue books and the blue ties. Of course, very telling as they walk into uh, the legislature room right there. Um, and so this is what we're waiting for. This will be the financial blueprint, obviously, for the year. Um, and as we've been talking about, this is a somewhat being called a post-pandemic budget where this isn't, for the first time in a long time, the main focus isn't on relief for pandemic-related issues. Of course, at Kema, as we mentioned, um, many municipalities are looking for relief mm -hmm. from that time. 
um, where they're, they're looking for money back from the province on money that they've spent to help people in the pandemic. Uh, we can just actually listen in for a few moments right now as they are there in the legislature. <clears throat> Order. Orders of the day. I recognize the government house leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci, government notice of motion number 11. Government notice of motion number 11, Mr. Bethlehem Falvey. I recognize the Minister of Finance. Uh, speaker, um, I move seconded by the Premier that this House approves in general the budgetary policy of the government. Minister of Finance has moved seconded by the Premier that this House approves in general the budgetary policy of the government. I will now ask the pages to deliver the budgets to the members. <laughs> a new record. <laughs> well done. Have all members received their copy of the budget? I will recognize the Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, before I begin, I would just like to acknowledge that we lost a great Canadian last week, Helen Vary. Helen Vary and her late beloved husband, George, came to this country with nothing but the shirt on their backs. And they helped build Canada. They were great visionaries and they were great philanthropists. And you know, Mr. Speaker, uh, they had a saying, they came, to this country, they came to Canada with nothing, and Canada gave them everything. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, the great legacy that Helen and George bestowed on us, and condolences to the family of Helen Berry. Thank you very much. I also want to acknowledge the great work that my parliamentary assistants uh, do to help me uh, come to this point. Uh, the parliamentary assistants, of course, uh, that I'm referring to is the great parliamentary assistant from Bruce Gray Owen Sound, where there you go. Rick. The great parliamentary assistant from Oakville behind me. I also want to acknowledge the great parliamentary assistants who went there before them and did such a great job <laughs> uh, from, from uh, Brantford Brant, from Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill, where's, where's the other ones? Uh, there's Stan Cho from Willowdale, how can I forget that? And Rudy Cazzetto, Mississauga Lakeshore. So thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to begin that on behalf of Premier Ford and our entire government, it is my honour to introduce the 2023 budget, building a strong Ontario. 
On behalf of Premier Ford and our entire government, it is my honour to introduce the 2023 Ontario Budget, Building a Strong Ontario. This plan is our blueprint for building a strong province during a time of economic challenges and change. It is a plan for a strong economy now and for the future. It's a plan to build more roads, more highways, more transit, and more broadband. It's a plan to build new long-term care homes, new hospitals, schools, and childcare spaces. It's a plan to build the critical minerals sector in Ontario's north, and at the same time invest in clean, green steel in Hamilton and Sault Ste. Marie, and connect them with the globally competitive sorry, globally competitive manufacturing sector in the South. It's a plan to build a health care system that connects people to the right care. It's a plan to do all of this to invest in our future, while at the same time returning Ontario to a balanced budget. This plan is our government's blueprint and Ontario's path, rooted in strong fundamentals, a long-term vision, and real action to not only face the current turbulence we see in the global economy, but emerge from it stronger than ever. Mr. Speaker, today I want to start with the numbers. Thanks to robust revenue growth, prudence, discipline planning, and clear priorities, I am pleased to report that in 2022 fiscal year, the deficit is proje projected to shrink to just $2.2 billion. In 2023-24, we plan to further reduce the deficit to $1.3 billion, and starting next year, we will return Ontario to the black with a modest surplus of $200 million. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is more than just a strong fiscal record. While uncertainty persists, this puts us in a position of fiscal strength. In fact, Ontario's net debt to GDP is now forecast to be 37.8% in 23-24, down 3.6% percentage points. And with our progress, the people of Ontario can have confidence that tomorrow will be better than today. And to be clear, a return to balanced budgets would not have happened under a Liberal or NDP government. <laughs> and, in this, and in this budget, we are showing it is possible to balance a budget while investing more in housing, more in highways, more in transit, more in the skilled trades, more in new manufacturing, and more in health care more in education, and more in the North. Here, here, here. Mr. Speaker, that is what we promised the people of Ontario that we would do in the last election. We promised we would get it done. And we are delivering on that promise today here in front of all of you. Now, Mr. Speaker, a lot has changed since we were first elected, uh, and particularly since our First, uh, that we first introduced a budget of 2022 just last year. The world is, to be frank, a more unsettled and uncertain place. Ontario is part of a global economy and is not immune to the impact of global forces, including geop uh, geopolitical tension provoked by Russia, Russian aggression in and against Ukraine, the reopening of China's economy, the energy transition and policies such as the United States Inflation Reduction Act. More and more global trading partners have begun looking inwards. Supply chains have become disruptive and strained. The post-pandemic environment has been defied by elevated inflation and have put the squeeze on the wallets of families and businesses. Mr. Speaker, people are finding it harder and harder to afford housing, to afford groceries, and to afford other household goods. And I as I've said many times, Ontario is not an island. 
And while we remain resilient, the seas around us are stormy. Our budget must reflect with continued prudence and planning assumptions that leave room for future surprises or shocks. While Ontario is still resilient, the storm is still raging around us, and our budget must take, into take it into account while planning in order to make sure that we have a flexibility to face surprises or shocks that could happen. Now, Mr. Speaker, there are plenty of reasons to be optimistic. I want the people of Ontario to know that despite the turbulence of the past year, we are doing better than most, and we have a flexible plan to address these ongoing economic challenges because, Mr. Speaker, serious times call for a serious budget. Mr. Speaker, this is a serious budget. And while much has changed since our last budget, economic circumstances have confirmed our plan and is the right one. In fact, our plan is showing early results. Ontario's population is growing, jobs are being created, and we are attracting manufacturing investments. Ontario's population is now over 15 million people, Mr. Speaker. We have over 275,000 more people a year moving into, Toronto, into Ontario. And Mr. Speaker, this is good news because with this growth, we are seeing stronger communities across Ontario. Mr. Speaker, I am as confident about Ontario's future as I ever have been. But while I see a brighter future in front of us, success is neither automatic or guaranteed. We all have to work for it by taking a responsible and flexible approach. And that's why we have a plan to build a strong, more resilient and more competitive economy right here at home. Mr. Speaker, we must increase our self-sufficiency and reduce our dependence on imports from parts of the world that have no intention of being reliable or fair trading partners. And Canada, particularly Ontario, is as well equipped as any place in the world to not only decouple from these adversarial regimes, but thrive while doing so. Take the Ring of Fire, Mr. Speaker. The Ring of Fire is our ticket to reduce our dependency on unstable or unfriendly foreign regimes. But that, of course, requires us to tap into the wealth, and tapping into that wealth, in turn, requires political will. For decades, previous governments ignored the immense wealth in Ontario's north for no other reason than that the work of developing that re resource was too hard. Well, our government, Mr. Speaker, is not afraid of hard work. We, we, we are working hand-in-hand hand with the First Nations in Northern Ontario to build the true partnership that will ensure both Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples can benefit from these untapped riches. You know, just a few short weeks ago, our government approved the First, uh, for the First Nations-led plan for the Northern Road Link. This is a major milestone to finally build all seasons roads. This is an important step forward to unlocking the full economic potential of the Ring of Fire. And of course, the building the, ring, uh, the road to the Ring of Fire is not by itself the solution. We have to get the minerals out of the ground. You've got to build the mines. Our government is once again taking this challenge head on. We have committed $1 billion to unlock critical minerals in Ontario's north and we continue to call on the federal government to match our commitment. We are also incenting and encouraging exploration by providing an additional $3 million to Ontario Junior Exploration Program this year and next. Of course, getting the minerals out of the ground is not the final step. We need to connect them to a world-class manufacturing sector. Now, you wouldn't know it, perhaps, but you, I would think we all do now, that Ontario happens to have just what it takes to create a world-class manufacturing sector. 
We have to link them to our manufacturing sector, which is world-class, and Ontario has this world-class manufacturing sector. In a little thought experiment, imagine if you headed out back and jumped into a car parked in the legislative parking lot, and perhaps, Mr. Speaker, it's an electric vehicle because we'd be going on a little road trip. We'd start by jumping on the Don Valley Parkway, heading to the 401 eastbound, which we have a plan to start widening at Brock Road in Pickering. Uh, we'd drive straight through Durham Region, maybe grab, grabbing a coffee in the great city of Pickering, or as I call it, the Pick, then through to Oshawa, by the way, Drake can call Toronto the Six. I think we can call Pickering the Pick. <laughs> we would drive through to Oshawa, which is benefiting from part. We're benefiting from part of GM's more than two billion dollar investment that will protect thousands of jobs. We might then double back a bit and turn north on the toll-free. Did I say that? The toll-free 412 and a hop on to Highway 7. Maybe take a, a detour to, to Richmond Hill, where Tesla is manufacturing the equipment to help make the batteries of the future. And maybe ultimately end up in Alston, where Honda is making a $1.4 billion investment to make hybrid vehicles. So then we need to get back south and hop on the 401 west to the 403 and pass through Oakville, where Ford is making a $1.8 billion investment to produce electric vehicles. Well, let's keep going. Let's continue down the 403 to Hamilton, where ArcelorMittal de Fasco is making a $1.8 billion investment in producing clean, green steel. But folks, we're not there yet. We're, we continue. We're going to go west on Highway 8, and we could swing by to Cambridge, and then keep on the 401 until you get to Woodstock, two proud auto towns where Toyota has invested $1.4 billion to make vehicles, including hybrids. And hear me out, Mr. Speaker. We could keep going further west on the 401 until we get to Ingersoll where GM has built Canada's full-scale EV manufacturing plant. And to cap off an amazing trip, we're going to keep going southwest until we get to Windsor, where Stellantis and LG Energy Solutions are investing more than $5 billion to build Ontario's first-ever large-scale EV manufacturing uh, battery plant with 2,500 new jobs. And, oh, by the way, Mr. Speaker, on our way back to Queen's Park, we'll take a, a brief detour, if that's all right, St. to St. Thomas, the future home of Volkswagen's first ever overseas battery yeah. cell plant. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, that trip is so exciting. Not once would you ask me if we're there yet. <laughs> it would be a beautiful road, Mr. Speaker, a scenic one, and most importantly, this is a road trip that would take us through some of the communities that are benefiting from the over $16 billion in investments by global auto manufacturers and suppliers of EV batteries and battery materials. And thank you to the leadership of Premier Ford and the great economic development minister, Vic Fideli. Ontario is now the heartland of Canada's electric vehicle revolution. It's difficult to overstate the incredible significance of that statement. After all, in 10 years, people buying a new car will choose between an electric vehicle and an electric vehicle. <laughs> and when they do, 
We're making sure they choose an Ontario-made electric vehicle. Now, Mr. Speaker, the global economy is changing, and we are seizing our competitive advantage as a province. We're not just going to keep up, uh, we're going to keep prospering under the leadership of this government, this Premier, and we're going to thrive in the economy of the future. The world, the global economy is changing, and we are seizing our competitive advantages as a province. We are not just going to keep up. Under the leadership of this government and this Premier, we are going to thrive in the economy of the future. We must continue to find ways to boost Ontario's competitiveness. That is why our government is working with partners to have shovel-ready industrial sites available for new manufacturing projects, and we are already seeing success with this as evidenced by Volkswagen's recent announcement. So let me say it again, Mr. Speaker. Ontario is now the heartland of Canada's electric vehicle revolution. And not one dollar of this investment, not a single one of these jobs, was automatic or guaranteed. While the previous government let more than 300,000 manufacturing jobs in Ontario flee, this government is bringing the cars of tomorrow, the jobs of the tomorrow, and the investments of tomorrow right back to Ontario, right here, right now, today. It took a lot of rebuilding, but Ontario manufacturing is back, Mr. Speaker. And it's time to keep that momentum up. That is why today we are proposing the Ontario Made Manufacturing Investment Tax Credit, a 10% tax, tax credit to help more Canadian controlled corporations expand, invest, create jobs, and become more competitive. Our message is this if you are prepared to bet big on Ontario, then Ontario is prepared to bet big on you. You know, seizing this immense opportunity will also require energy. We are proud to support the continued safe operation of the Pickering Nuclear Generating Station and the refurbishments of the Darlington and Bruce Power Nuclear Generating Stations. In fact, we've already started construction on the small modular reactor at Darlington. And we are leading in record, in record battery procurements with the largest battery storage project in Canada being built right here in Ontario in partnership with the Six Nations of Grand River Development Corporation, Northland Power, NR Store, and the Acon Group. And this government will continue supporting the development of small modular reactors, which will be essential to future supply. Now, we know companies are refusing to invest in jurisdictions that don't help them achieve their environmental, social, and government's goals. And once again, Ontario is poised to, th to thrive. For example, to help boost competitiveness, the government is launching a voluntary clean ed energy credit registry. Mr. Speaker, we are seizing our clean energy advantage today for tomorrow. Yes. Now, Mr. Speaker, if I could take you back to our little thought experiment, you know, our manufacturing road trip. You know what it depends on? For that road trip, it depends on having functioning highways, doesn't it? And our plan is the right plan for transit and highways, Mr. Speaker. The Liberals and NDP never spared much thought to highways or the people stuck on them. And in the last election, it seems that the voters of Peel region across the GTA noticed. Okay, well, we as don't uh, Finance drivers, Minister Peter Bettenfalvey continues to... And so um, give the budget here in the legislature. We will bring back our panel to react to some of what we've heard so far and some of the main highlights. This is a budget that is $205 billion in spending, the biggest in the province's history, $6 billion more than last year's budget. 
John, the one word you mentioned that this is a more, more, more budget from your perspective. <laughs> Describe yeah. what, what you meant by that. Well, it is a more budget, and the Minister of Finance himself said it's a more budget, and it's one where I think you're seeing uh, unprecedented spending. You know, when, when the NDP kept thinking that, well, the government's not going to spend, they're going to cut, they're going to be able to do this. In fact, they've done the opposite. They've actually, they've actually not only, they've broken their own health care spending record by way of how much money they're spending on this, on this particular budget. But also, I think what's key, though, is that there's that level of responsibility, that level of balance that the, you're seeing in this budget, which shows that it, the deficit's going to be covered or the, the, the budget will be balanced over the course of the next year or two years. Um, and I think that's ahead of schedule, which I think, again, is that responsibility part of the budget, which allows for any potential flux of, of the economy that we, with that uncertainty that we're going to probably see in the next little while, we, we're going to have at least that that we can sort of um, um, rest, rest assured on with respect to that balance and, and that responsibility. And the last thing I'll say is a lot of that clean energy. You saw a lot of the investments that, that the minister was talking about, the EV batteries, the Toyota, um, you know, the, the, the steel, the clean steel, all of those investments are for the future of this province, and those are really mm -hmm. big spends. And Grant, I want to turn to you next <laughs> to react to our friend John here <laughs> and react to the finance minister where he says, from their perspective, this is a more, more budget. It seems like there is a heavy emphasis and support on industry, but maybe not across the board. Well, I also need to comment on how many dad jokes were in that <laughs> speech of Drake and Cole, Toronto the Six, then we can call Pickering the Pick, I think is what he said. Uh, but yeah, all jokes aside, when we hear this budget, we hear about this extra spending, let's contextualize it. So we know that during the last mandate of this government that they had money that they were sitting on that they chose not to invest in our healthcare system. So when we talk about excessive spending now, or increased spending, I should say, in our healthcare system, Understand that it's now under this new system where there's going to be private health care facilities that are going to be providing health care services. Now, private health care facilities are going to cost taxpayers more money because you have to factor in profit. So ultimately, when we're seeing the, the, the kind of the, you, you know, you zoom back, look at the picture, we once again see a government that sat on money, chose not to invest in our health care system, and now is privatizing it. It's going to be a more costly system, and we have some increased spending. My question is, is it going to actually help address the backlogs at our hospitals, is going to help retain nurses, is going to help make sure nurses are, are treated respectfully by making sure they're being reimbursed properly and paid properly and adequately. So there's still a lot of questions uh, in this budget, and I'm, I'm really concerned that it's not going to be prioritizing people first. Mm -hmm. And Kemi, your perspective on this budget too, there's been a lot of talk in this budget about a path to a balanced budget and a $200 million surplus by 24, 25. Uh, and what we touched on earlier, that there is going to be no bailout for Toronto on mm -hmm. this COVID hangover fund as well. Your reaction to what you've heard and what you've seen as the big headlines from this budget? Well, I think in terms of the bailouts, we were speaking about that earlier. I, I definitely said, uh-oh, and this is going to be a big problem for whoever is going to become near, mayor in the in coming June. Mm -hmm. and I think it's also going to dominate the um, upcoming by-election um, by 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 election mayoral um, election rather so I think that's something that we need to grapple with I think um, you know unfortunately Toronto may have to t tap into its reserve fund to you know fill up that hole in terms of the theme of the budget I, it's interesting in comparison to the budget last year where it was clearly an election budget populist budget had clear investment to the people, like Gurantine mentioned. I think here now it's primarily focused on infrastructure, roads, building hospitals, mm -hmm. and I'm still grappling to figure out how that will um, impact folks right away. I, I'm still trying to figure out how will it help in terms of affordability, people who are struggling buying groceries. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, that, I'm still waiting to hear that answer. And Kim, it's also interesting when we talk about when we have a provincial budget. Uh, show like this where, where they're presenting the present provincial budget there is so much talk about how this mean what this means for municipalities but particularly the Toronto right now where there isn't a mayor mm -hmm. there's obviously uh, deputy um, deputy mayor McKelvey is filling those shoes but as you said what happens today what's announced today is make is going to make a huge deal over the next couple months in terms of who comes out uh, who wants to run for mayor mm -hmm. and what their platform will be because all of a sudden, the government set the agenda for what this mayor is going to have to focus on. So that'll be a, a, a key issue for or for the municipal race as well. Absolutely, and I'm excited. I, I'm not curious. I'm rather curious to hear what Jennifer McAlvey is going to say once she hears that there's, she's not receiving any money. And to your point, this will absolutely dominate, or at least very much determine what Canada should be talking about. How are you mm -hmm. going to offer more services to Torontonians when there's again this massive hole within the budget, especially when. Most of them have, don't have council experience. We're thinking about the Mitzi Hunters, the Mark Saunders, who have um, demonstrated interest in running. You're now learn 
new to the role and having to deal with this big problem and also having to negotiate with the level of government who has made it clear that they're not interested in supporting that way. But just to add on to that point, uh, when we talk about how people engage with services, like how, how are their quality of life is increased, it's often at the city level, right? Cities are those right. institutions mm -hmm. that provide, you know, so many supports from childcare to programming to, to, to much, much more. Now, if the province is not adequately funding our municipalities, that is demonstrating why this budget is something that's actually not prioritizing people first. Because that means that, like in Toronto, we're not talking about expanding services. It's going to be just maintaining base level mm -hmm. quality of, of services right now. This is a really big deal, and it could really, and it will really hurt people's ability to access the the day to day services they need right now. If they, if we're not getting this uh, this funding from the from the province. And for, and for your point, John, I'll get to you in a second. For, for your point, basically, what you're saying is that the old saying is all politics is local. When you step outside your door, it's the municipal government that that funds the first things that you see firsthand. And so that is your point will be like that is is where citizens might lose out here. And and, and municipalities are creatures of the province. Mm -hmm. So like, it, I don't think you know Ford is not in a position to say, well, that's Toronto's problem. No. As premier, he has a duty to make sure that every single person in Ontario is getting the services they need to live their best lives. By you know, cutting off funding to the cities, the impact is that everyday folks in Brampton, Mississauga, and Toronto are not going to have access to the quality services they need to live their best lives. John, you wanted to jump yeah, in. Yeah, I was going to say, and, and Giratan will be, will be happy to know that I'll be disagreeing with him on this point. But, <laughs> really? But, <laughs> but, 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 but government money flows down, right? So the feds to the province, the province mm -hmm. to the municipalities is how it works, especially when it comes to ju shared jurisdictional uh, uh, responsibilities like transportation, health, energy, environment, and other things. And, and I find that just because this budget might not have any particular bailout for the city of Toronto, let's not forget the fact that for the last four years of this the prime of the premier's uh, uh, govern, government, he has given Toronto a lot of money. Not, notwithstanding the fact that he gave a lot of money during the pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, everything that John Tory basically asked for, you know, the transportation money, infrastructure, health care during the pandemic, he was given money to the to the city of Toronto. In fact, I, I think the premier said that over billions of dollars was given to the city of Toronto. So let's not forget that it's not just the the, the beginning and the end of this budget. Money was given to the city of Toronto and will always be. And also, I think the the premier made a really good point about making sure that municipalities. Have have their own responsibility of ensuring, ensuring that there's some fiscal responsibility and, and prowess on their side, right? Come back with some level of efficiencies. This is something that, that former Mayor Rob Ford did and, and obviously Doug, who was a councillor at the time, where they said, you know, they were going to look for efficiencies first and foremost before asking governments for more money. talking about, about auditing municipalities and, and think, in this case. Right, and I think that makes a lot of sense because a lot of municipalities over the course of decades have probably overspent money that they shouldn't be spending money, and I know there's efficiencies there. So that audit will make them, will force them mm. to actually look for those efficiencies, which helps everybody. Fascinating conversation with you guys. We'll continue on this. I want to get to this first. For more on some of the big items in this provincial budget, what's in it or not for Toronto, here's CTV's Natalie Johnson with more. Toronto was hoping for a handout, but was left in the lurch. Transit fares could go up, property taxes could go up even higher than they've already been raised. Uh, you're going to see potentially a, a decrease in services if, if the city can't cover those costs. The province's biggest city passed its own budget last month with a billion dollar shortfall, banking on help from the province to relieve major pandemic pressures. But the $510 million for COVID-19 costs it wanted from Queen's Park did not come. We need, of course, the municipalities to do their part right across the province. And uh, so we'll work with the, with the cities uh, on uh, the, their financial challenges and, of course, uh, we'll continue that dialogue. Toronto officials were also hoping that the province would cover the cost of the development charges the city will no longer receive as a result of the province's recent housing bill. The government said any help with that shortfall would come after a provincial audit of the city's books down the road. You know, they want more money. We want to find out where, where the waste is. The finance minister did say the province would fund the wraparound services for residents in support of homes that the city had called for. We're delivering the $48 million that they requested. We're also increasing the amount of mental health and addiction supports. Too little, too late, says the opposition. Because the, the Conservatives are not stepping up, Torontonians are going to be seeing a big property tax hike and service cuts. A cash-strapped city denied the bailout it had banked on, now forced to figure out how to bridge its big budget gap. And we're also getting reaction from opposition parties and industry organizations. All that is starting to trickle in now. Ontario NDP leader Marit Stiles releasing a statement 
That reads in part, Ford's budget fails to meet the moment and shows he isn't interested in making the investments we need in public health care, affordable housing or education, all the things that make Ontario a place where people want to live, work, learn and grow. People are struggling. They're not able to keep up with the rising cost of groceries, rent or gas, and they feel they're losing control of their lives, livelihoods and futures. This budget is a failure of leadership. True leaders meet the moment. This one is out of touch. A statement from Ontario Green Party leader Mike Schreiner reads in part, we can't prepare for a better future unless we tackle the multiple urgent crises that are affecting us today, climate, housing, health care, mental health and poverty. But this head in the sand budget shows a government in denial of the need to invest in the people of this province of this province. Not only is this failure to act bad for people, it's bad fiscal policy. And we're getting reaction from the Canadian Mental Health Association. They've released a statement that reads in part, in many ways, this is an historic budget for CMHA branches across Ontario and the broader community mental health and addiction sector. In addition to providing typical program-based funding, the government is stabilizing the sector with a 5% boost to our overall operational budgets. This is extremely rare and we are so grateful to the government for hearing our call to action. So we've uh, got okay. reaction starting to trickle in from the uh, um, NDP and Greens and also from stakeholders as well. John, I want to get your reaction to you know hearing this is from the NDP and Greens saying this is out of touch, this is bad fiscal policy, this doesn't meet the moment. These are some of the buzzwords that came out of the statement from Marit Stiles and Mike Schreiner as well. Well, I think, you know, you expect that from the opposition parties. Obviously, they're going to come back and they're going to say that the budget's not good, it's not far enough. But I think the reality of, of this is that, that, that the budget has actually spent a lot of money and is spending a lot of money over the course of the last little while. But what's more important, less so than from the opposition, because you're expecting them to come negative, is what you heard from the Canadian Mental Health Association, mm -hmm. where they actually said it's a historic budget when it comes to mental health. And that's something that the Premier has always made a commitment uh, well, on is mental health and in health care. So I find that that I would weigh a lot more than the opposition because quite frankly I'm actually surprised because Merritt Stiles has taken the same old approach that Andrew Horvath took which was that no and negative and everything is is not good enough, it's not fast enough, it's not enough money as opposed to being productive and saying well there's certain things that the government's looking at that they should that they're doing well maybe they should be doing it better as opposed to just flat out saying it's a, it's a bad budget which I think mm -hmm. is just not going to serve her well. And Kim, from the perspective of, you know, we talked about the average citizen, is that there is so much on all of our plates right now where, you know, inflation is causing so much to go up. Grocery <laughs> prices are going up substantially as well. Uh, we, we hear throughout the past year, rent, particularly in Toronto, has gone up exponentially as well. Mm -hmm. um, and whether this is a, a big bu a budget that is big on investing in industry and investing to the future and bringing down uh, bringing a path to a balanced budget. The bottom line is that in the day-to-day -day stuff, the question is what's in it for me tomorrow? What's in it for your average citizen tomorrow? That's a good question. I'm not too sure that I can answer. Mm -hmm. But that said, I think this government has is catering to a very specific population within the province. I think they're very much catering to the same people who, and they said it earlier when they're in Mr. Finance speech, He's, you know, he committed to something in the budget, or rather during the election, which is to get things done, to build Ontario. And I think he's investing in people who want to see that growth. People who are um, working class, mm -hmm. who work in trades and skills development, who are the people who are going to be working in the factories or, um, you know, in, in green energy, the, the investments that they've been announcing with in the, over the past few days. That said, to your point, what about the folks who are unable to pay their rent, who are... Um, worried about safety on the TTC, I think that is a bit of a gap within this budget. And I don't think they're thinking about those folks currently today. I think they're more trying to build a province and they're executing on their election platform. Mm -hmm. And Grant, from when you're, you're reading what some of the main highlights in this budget and listening to the finance minister, what does this budget say to you for the, the mandate that this government believes they got from the people last year? Uh, Doug Ford has always been a lot about building. And, and putting infrastructure first and putting in, in the, you know, investing in industry. And that seems to be the case with this budget as well. What does that say to you about where they're taking their mandate? You know, so when we talk about where they're taking their mandate, let's look at the tone 
of this conversation and what we know is the reality of people right now. So the, the uh, you know, Minister Bethlehem Foley had a very, you know, he's taking a tone about building this path forward and, and, and this bright future of Ontario. But when you talk to everyday folks right now in the province and across Canada, they're stressed out. Like their main focus, a lot of people can't see next week, uh, mind you, tomorrow. They're just living day to day, hand to mouth, because it's a really tough time economically with regards to cost of living, access to health care, the services we rely on every day. And I think that's why my, re my reaction to this budget is one that it does seem out of touch to me. It seems like uh, they're presenting one kind of uh, you know, future for Ontario, but it's not putting into place the fact that you need to address the crisis right now before you build for the future. And the mm -hmm. crisis right now is affordability, access to health care, nurses leaving the profession, being laid off, emergency rooms shutting down. Like, it, it's a tough time right now. And I don't think the, that this budget captures, quite frankly, the crisis that we're in right now. It is a tough time across mm -hmm. the board, and we need measures right now to address these crises. The finance minister is still uh, delivering the budget. Uh, let's go back and, and listen in for a few more minutes to uh, what he has to say. Pay with their OHIP card, not their credit card. Our plan also includes hiring and training thousands of more health care workers, including doctors. Because our government understands it is challenging for Ontario residents in medical school to find residency, residency spots here at home. And we believe if an Ontario student wants to become a doctor and care for their fellow citizens, government should not stand in their way. We should get out of their way. So we are. Mr. Speaker, we will also add 100 seats for medical undergraduates and continue to prioritize Ontario students for these spots. Mr. Speaker, throughout the pandemic, our government invested billions to protect people, communities and businesses. We went to extraordinary lengths to support our province. Unprecedented times called for unprecedented investments in our pandemic response. Now as we look ahead, because of the miracle of vaccines, we're able to move forward. That means starting to wind down COVID-specific spending, which was always intended to be time limited and reinvesting in priority areas like connecting people to family doctors, home care, pediatric care, mental health and addiction supports care. Because Mr. Speaker, we're investing in bringing connected and con convenient care to the people of Ontario. So while spending on the pandemic is winding down, investments in a stronger future are ramping up. Mr. Speaker, our government will be also investing more to protect our most vulnerable. Youth leaving the child welfare system are at a higher risk of being trafficked or experiencing homelessness. That is why our government is providing $170 million over three years to the Ready, Set, Go program, which supports the success of youth leaving child welfare care. Young people leaving the child welfare system are at higher risk of being trafficked or experiencing homelessness. That is why our government is providing... All right, as the finance minister continues to deliver the budget, let's go live. cb 24s Jamie Griffin, who is at Queen's Park with details on the province's latest spending plan. Jamie, you are already getting some reaction. Yeah, right. Obviously, there's going to be no shortage of reaction to this budget. And I want to bring in J.P. Hornick right now, the president of OPSU. Uh, first off, uh, your initial reaction to the budget that you just heard. Yeah, I was looking for more in this budget that was actually an investment in people, in social services, in the very things that allow us to create a community of caring. And instead, what we're seeing is a budget that focuses on manufacturing, but I would argue it's a manufactured crisis that they're creating. They're continuing to underfund human services, things that are frontline workers, public Public education, health care, we're not seeing spending in the things that we need coming out of a pandemic. This is the biggest spending budget in the province history, uh, nearly $205 billion. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism that this government wasn't spending enough money, but here you have them with the largest budget that we've seen in the province history. 
isn't that what the people of Ontario wanted? It's a it's a classic conservative move to create this shell game where you announce a whole bunch of bunch of spending in your budget when you've actually reduced spending over time. So according to the Financial Accountability Office, by 2027, this government will have underspent uh, 21.6 billion dollars. When you look at the money that they've taken out of health care, putting a paltry amount back in that doesn't actually cover the cost, that doesn't cover increases in staffing. Peter Bethlen Falvey was just talking about his tour of Ontario and the manufacturing plant they're creating in Alliston. What he's not mentioning is the over a dozen health care workers that were just laid off at Stevenson Hospital there. What would you want to see more of in terms of when it comes to uh, you know impacting your members? What I'd like to see is an investment in public services and a recognition that those are the very things we need coming out of a pandemic in order to create a strong economy. By their own admission, we have a resilient economy. We have an economy that's growing. The time to invest right now is in people, in those frontline services. Manufacturing is fantastic, but those workers' bodies are going to break down. Their kids are going to need to go to school. The public services that we learned are the fabric of our social safety net during the pandemic, are the very things that are not being addressed in this budget. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Scott, we're going to have a lot of reaction coming out. I believe uh, the, uh, the budget's still going on right now, a little bit longer than expected, but uh, we're going to bring you as much reaction as we can here on CP24. Thanks for now. All right, yeah, Jamie is correct. The budget is still being presented at this time. Finance Minister Peter Beth and Falvey still presenting the budget, but uh, Jamie already getting reaction to uh, what we've heard and some of the main headlines as we continue to look live at uh, the Finance Minister Peter Beth and Falvey continuing to deliver this budget. And he's been going on now for almost 40 minutes. He was pretty prompt uh, to get up there, as we said, a bit late doing the walk uh, from, the, from the Premier's office to the legislature. But... Uh, he was pretty much on time to, to start delivering this budget, and John, this is this is so we quite a long time he's been going on delivering on this challenge. budget. Well, he's got a lot of spending announcements <laughs> he's got to be able to make over the course of the next hour or so. So I'm not surprised that it's uh, that it's going on on too much too, too long. But I, what I am surprised, what I'm not surprised about, is the fact that obviously you know go figure that there it's not never it's not enough, right? You know, oh, it's not enough money. This is a historically a, a huge budget by way of spend, 200 billion dollars, six billion dollars more than last time, and again, it's never enough. It's not enough money. And I think what, what the Premier and this government are doing, which I think is actually very smart, is, is that they're investing in the future of the province. They're, they're, they're making sure that today, knowing that there's uncertainty in the economy, and there could be some uncertainty in the economy, that there's going to be some foundation that they're, they're building so that, that if, if there is some, some situation that, that occurs down the road, there's going to be some level of reserve, some level of, of caution being taken that. But also jobs that they're creating and the opportunity and, and, and the health uh, uh, and the health care and also this green energy uh, investments that they're making, those are all jobs that are being created in this province that are going to turn the economy around. That's a big deal for this, uh, for this province. I need to push back a little bit on that because historic funding doesn't mean much, historic spending doesn't mean much if we're not spending on the right issues, on the issues that people are dealing with right now. We know for a fact that health care is a really huge issue for people and that it's in, a, it's in a top position. We know people are having excessive wait times. We know nurses are being laid off. We know that our health care system is in a, in a point of crisis right now. And the four Conservatives have had, this is their second mandate now. They, this is a, a crisis that has occurred underneath their watch. And they have an opportunity to spend in the right places to make sure health care system is stronger. But what we're seeing is nurses being laid off, emergency rooms shutting down. We're seeing a health care system that is not uh, adequately being funded enough. And we know by way of fact that the Ford Conservative government chose not to, to, to spend when they, they're sitting on the money. So mm -hmm. in, I, the concern is there because ultimately, what are people asking for? They want to make sure that people have access to the resources that they need. And sorry, I just got to cut, cut you off right there, Gretchen. Uh, Thank you very much. We're getting more. Re Thanks. Take care. That is James Giffen was talking to Liberal Leader John Fraser right there as as um as a short one, a very short one, yeah. <laughs> he basically, said he agreed with the budget and went, went, went back in yeah. the legislature. So they are heading to the media studio right now to get reaction. Uh, the finance minister Peter Bethenfalvy just wrapped, and so that's uh, some people leaving the legislature right now, heading to the media studio. Of course, we'll hear pretty quickly, pretty promptly hear from the Liberals and the NDP. And Kim, I, I wanted to continue this this conversation as we heard from Opsu. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the concern was is that there's a lot of investment but not particularly in people was, was the comment there. Exactly and I think we can't be fully surprised that they're not investing in what we assume, especially following the election. I think last year they heavily invested in people. It was a very populist um, 
budget, and that was because they were heading into the election. I think now this is not only their second mandate, this is the first budget of that mandate. I think they have time to invest greatly into that, um, into people and invest in, in, in a way that they invested last year. I think that said, um, it is a bit missing the mark. There is a sense of urgency that they are probably not really meeting, and I think that's what the OPSU leader was saying here. So I think that's what you're saying as well. Mm -hmm. But to your point... Wait, you put it... You put it back, <laughs> no, it's like you put it... You took the words right out of my mouth, you know? It's two against one right now, John, so... <laughs> I'm used to that. I, I do think some people are saying that they want more jobs, and that's what they're doing. I think they're mm -hmm. catering to a very specific group of folks. They're not catering to all of them. I think that's what you're trying to say, is that I think there's some people who are missing or are not being captured in this budget. Mm -hmm. And John, I want to touch, uh, ask you about, you know, the path uh, to a balanced budget. You know, asking before, before I came out, I was talking to Giratan about, about where that money maybe could be better spent versus, you know, focusing on the balanced budget just yet. But, but your, in your opinion, is that a good plan now over the next couple of years where they're talking about a surplus in just a matter of mere years there coming out of a COVID-19 pandemic, which threw everything. Yeah. Uh, off kilter. Yeah, and, and if again, and if they didn't have a contingency fund during the pandemic or before the pandemic, we would have been in a lot worse situation than we than we were at the time. So obviously, governments and, and all governments had to sort of pivot and deal with the pandemic because it was global and, and it was unprecedented. And I think all governments did the best they could with what they had. And I think this government, as well, and, and, and Guritan talks about healthcare and, and long-term care facilities. Long-term care was a problem that's been that's been systemic for decades. Mm -hmm. A lot of governments previous. Uh, didn't, didn't spend enough money and time and attention on long-term care. What the pandemic did is it shone a spotlight on the problem, and this government tried to deal with it and tried to d d do as much as they could to make sure that they had more build, more, more, more facilities, more buildings, more, more facilities to be able to have the, the long-term care at least fixed or at least on the right path of, of being fixed. But what I would say about the balanced budget, though, Scott, is, is that at the end of the day, there has to be some level of control. You can't keep spending money. At the end of the day, if you're like if you're a family at home and you just keep spending money, at some point it's going to run out, or at some point you're going to get so leveraged in a in a negative way that you're not going to be able to sustain yourself. So the government now has funds where they can be able to put some money to, to deficit control, which actually helps the province in the long run. And and because this is a balanced and a responsible budget, they're doing some of that whilst still spending 200 billion dollars on spending. So it's a responsible, balanced budget. But balanced uh, budget does the document today and, and as we wait for the opposition leaders the, uh, the opposition parties now to to react to this Gretchen, I want to get your, your personal experience here from sitting in that chamber yourself mm -hmm. as an opposition member what is that day like and now after the budget is presented what are the conversations that are being had uh, prepping the leader to go out and make make their comments um, from from your perspective who sat in that chamber who sat through budgets um, where they're not your party's budgets. What is that day like for, for, for members right now? It, this is a really important day uh, mm -hmm. for folks in the legislature, for the opposition, and for Ontarians because it's a day you get to see where the priorities are mm -hmm. going to be. Today is about choices, and you get to see where the choices uh, or what choices the government is going to make. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my experiences, we, we've seen, and my reaction has been very similar to how I feel today, where we're seeing choices that are being made that are not prioritizing people who are struggling in this very moment with respect to health care, right. housing, and cost of living. So it's a day where you're, you're, you're waiting in anticipation. You're, you know, it's, there's an embargo until the budget comes out, and, and then you get the information very quickly, and then you're just everyone's, everyone's all flipping right through it, yeah. searching, and just trying to understand what their community is getting or not mm. getting, and then starting to advocate for it. Let's head back to Queen's Park now, where uh, CP24's Jamie Goodfroy is standing by with more reaction. Jamie. Yeah, thank you very much, Scott. I want to bring in uh, Yolanda McLean with uh, QP Ontario. Uh, Yolanda, we just heard uh, from uh, the head of OPSU here. Uh, said She says that, uh, listen, this uh, this budget heavily invested in, in manufacturing, but not enough on people, you know, as uh, par part of QP Ontario. W what's your take on this budget? Are you happy? Well, you know, it has... Um when you ask me if I'm happy about it, I can tell you how I just feel as a, as not just the Secretary Treasury of Keeping Ontario, but how our members also feel. Um, you know, the Ford government was given another opportunity to run this government in a positive way and to make some changes. And I just feel that he failed us and uh, the people of Ontario in particular, if they're not, if they're not uh, feel like they're invested in, then it doesn't make our province run smoothly and work properly, especially when it's not, uh, when the 
investments aren't put into public services, the services that we provide to help uh, people operate every day. Where else could they have improved on in, in, from your perspective? Well, when I think about public services in particular, and when I think about health care, long-term care, um, uh, more beds, uh, more homes, uh, the workers that we have, the workers that we represent are already uh, in precarious jobs, working two, three jobs to make ends meet, which is already very uh, stressful, which also leaves shortages of jobs. Uh, we, uh, If they would invest in more people, then it would be uh, less stress on our members for sure. And of course, and the adequate services, it's not enough uh, to say that uh, we're investing just uh, predominantly in trades. Now, don't get me wrong, this is not about pitting on each other. This is not about conquering and dividing. Uh, the same way they invested in trades, it's very important to invest in public services. Uh, Ford said he's going to work with unions, and uh, QP is also a union. And so this, will also, this also gives him an opportunity to work with us uh, in increasing public services uh, today. Yolanda McLean with uh, QP Ontario, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And Scott, the ledge just came out, and as you can see, it's a packed house here at Queen's Park. We're going to get a lot more reaction coming up uh, at Live at Five. We'll send it back to you for now. Yeah, busy time now after the uh, finance minister wrapped. Uh, delivering the budget. Um, thank you so much, Jamie. Good for on live at Queens Park, and thank you so much to my expert panel to provide the insight. Thank you for your time and insight. It was a fascinating conversation, as you said, a very important day in the province for everyone here in this province. So thank you for your time. A pleasure as always. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Always fun. Time now is 4:55 and six degrees. This is Toronto's breaking news. CP24. Of course, we just heard from the Ontario Finance Minister Peter Bethenfalvy to deliver the government's 2023 budget, which is the biggest spending budget in the province's history. The largest share of that is going toward the health care sector. We'll have much more coverage coming up on Live at 5, including reaction from the opposition parties. Stay with us.